I've got a thing here I wrote the exact happening of the shootout at the OK Corral. Listen, I've got the whole shootout, the summation of the last of what happened. This better be good, Ray. OK, what happened at the fight. It will be good. Let me ask you about a, another show, because you did some of the, the early classic westerns on TV. You, uh, Gray Ghost, uh, Death Valley Days, Ren Tin Tin, Lawman. But in, in your Death Valley Days episode, uh, and I guess those are all based on true stories. Right. Your wife, Jan Shepard, <laughs> yes. was in that. Yes, that's very true. It was a wonderful yeah. show. How did that come about that the two of you were cast together? We had uh, access or knew very well or had personal personal interest with casting directors. Mm -hmm. I think really that particular show was cast through somebody we knew, mm -hmm. all right? And so they put us on the show. And of course, <laughs> it's a funny thing, when we got there, there was, everybody was buddying up in the rooms. So what happens is they had down John Shepard and Ray Boyle. Okay, this is why I was going by Ray Boyle, to be in one room, right? So my wife says, no, it's not John Shepard, it's Jan Shepard. Oh, they said, well, we're sorry. We had, she says, don't worry about it because we're married. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Those were fun shows, yeah, I think, it was. the Death Valley Days. And, and in that uh, show, he doesn't even get billed, but Dub yeah. Taylor is in that. What was Very he like good. on set? Oh, Dub was great. Yeah. Dub was so funny all the time. Mm -hmm. It was a funny thing. I had a, I was kind of, it was called Yeller. Yes. And I was afraid to go down in the mines. And uh, so I was kind of been really pushed aside because I was kind of a little chicken about doing these particular things. So finally, I mean, I get up the iron, there's a big fight scene and things like that. So it winds up, I mean, where I had a good character going both places. I mean, both, uh, you know, kind of reserved and also all of a sudden everything comes in glued. And you get the girl at the end, too. Yes, absolutely. Which was nice. <laughs> to keep. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have researched... Like I said, I've written this book out of my adore, and I did a tremendous amount of research. I started out doing it to feel what my part was as Morgan Earp as far as the series was concerned. Mike Clanton's back in town this morning. He's cold sober. He's still making fight talk. He says the McLowry's and several other guns are on their way into town. So in doing that research, I fell in love with his family. In other words, he was sixth generation, sixth generation American. His father fought in two battles. His grandfather was a judge and an attorney. In fact, Wyatt was supposed to, in his training, take over his grandfather's business. But they decided when they were leaving from Pella, Iowa, to California, he took a big group of people, and all there was about 40 people from the city when he was, they knew he was coming to California, wanted to join the wagon train. He was only six, Dwight was only 16 years old at the particular time. But he could outshoot with any gun, his peers, or, you know, the, 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 the older people. It was a matter where, uh, where he drove first wagon behind his dad, and at that particular time, when he went on this wagon train, he fell in love with the outside, and he did not want to go back to the studies to take over his grandfather's business. There's a tremendous story as far as his moving from, from those days into what he became. Now he was in Ellsworth, 
Wichita, and Dodge. Now those were all cowboys that were driving cattle from Texas and they, when they came to the end of the line and they got their pay, all they wanted to do was have fun and, you know, uh, live it up as far as everything is concerned. So, Nothing's changed, it's still the same. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, still the same, right. So what happened was, Wyatt, in other words, in those particular days, I mean, he had about seven other guys that marshaled with him, especially in, in, when it got to Dodge. That was probably one of the biggest. They used to get $2.50 a head when they arrested somebody. <laughs> now, while it was brought in, there was about 70, gun, 70 people shot in Dodge before Wyatt was finally called in to become a marshal. He was told he wanted to keep people from being shot. So in other words, for him to set things up the way he should. And so what happened was these guys still wanted to get out there and raise hell. And it was a matter where he said, if they didn't allow them to do that, they would find some place else to go. So what happens is Wyatt set up the other side of the railroad track where you could do anything you wanted to do. But if you were a good boy, you could come on back, okay? Now, we're going to get down to, to, to Tombstone, Arizona. Tombstone was hardcore outlaws. With a crooked sheriff, Johnny Behan. Oh, Johnny Behan. It was a funny thing. Johnny Mann was pretty sharp. He, to become U.S. Marshal, he didn't want Wyatt. He went to Wyatt and he says, hey, you know, if you don't run, I know I'll wind up getting this job and you can be under sheriff and do anything you want to do. Well, Wyatt already was running a faro game at the Occidental Cafe and he was making pretty good money. So he said, okay, fine. So what happens is, BN became the sheriff, and in turn, why didn't get anything to do <laughs> with what BN had put, said he was going to do? Do you think I'm just a poor country sheriff? Poor? I never ask a man how much money he has, Mr. BN. You know, my salary with fees is about uh, $40,000 a year. Mm, that's a lot. And I collect all the taxes in Cochise County. My share of court costs and fees is around 10000 You are rich. And I'm just getting started politically. I'm really a, I'm really a, a Western poet, okay? Now, if, if you would allow, I've, I've got the OK Corral. I wrote a whole book on Wyatt Earp, okay? I tell you what, we... Give me just three pages. Give me three. <laughs> at the, at the very end. Want three pages? No, at the very end. Okay, okay listen, All I've right. got the whole shootout, but I can, I can just give you the summation of the last, of what happened. This better be good, Ray. Okay, what happened at the fight. <laughs> it will be good. Don't go any further. Or if I order you not to go any further, I'm the sheriff and I'll do the arrest. You said that was Virgil's job. Herb, don't go in that corral. You're going to get killed. Now the shootout took less than 20 seconds and 34 rounds of lead, with the herbs and docks still standing and three of the outlaws dying or dead. Four of the cowboys fired 17 shots by the time the battle was done. Ike Clanton, whose bragging brought on the fight, didn't seem to have a gun. The cowboy outlaws had scored three hits none finding the vital spots. The Earps and Holiday fired 17 rounds and 13 were fatal shots. As the smoke of the battle lifted, mixed emotion filled the air. Depending whose side you chose to be on, was the gunfight foul or fair? It seems the three dead cowboys were carrying a large getaway stash. One of the items the coroner uncovered was $3,000 in cash. 
If the gunfight had gone the other way and they'd shot the lawmen down, they figured to hide out in Mexico until resentment cooled in town. A hearing was held and Judge Spicer was the one to conduct the case, to investigate and hear witness and each lawful step retrace. Judge Spicer announced he could find no reason to appease the cowboy mob when four duly appointed peace officers were only doing their job. After days of court and testimony that had witness to the fight, Judge Spicer ruled in view of the facts the lawmen were in the right. The law was fully justified in doing what had to be done, discharging his official duty against the man who packs a gun. Now, when you pick up a book of history on those rugged frontier days, I'm sure the story of the O.K. Corral will be told in many ways. But that piece of ground Ed Shefflin found and stayed to dignify will always be known as his tombstone and a town too tough to die. Oh. That's great. He was right, he should have read it. That was great. That was wonderful. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, you know, it's a strange thing. It was like, uh, I feel right now at my age, I feel like Wyatt must have, when Stuart Lake was interviewing him, I'm 94. Whoa. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't quite remember a lot of the things that I, that I used to. Okay. Well, then you switched from acting yeah. uh, to, to creating props. Right. i tell you what happens is both my wife and I were actors, and all of a sudden, it was a funny thing, the old system. And when television first kind of came along, the old system said, well, the big studio says, when, the, when television gets big enough, we'll absorb it. Okay, well, Lucille Ball's series was so famous that she bought RKO, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Instead of RKO absorbing her series, she wound up buying RKO. So that's kind of a spot where uh, it was indecision, and you could shoot a cannon down most of these studios without hitting anybody because the business was really kind of not knowing what it was going to do. So I went into Warner Brothers Studio and they put me to, to work with special effects. So I worked many, many, many shows building special props. Let, let me just give you an example. Enter the Dragon, oh. Enter the Dragon. So what happens is it was opening at Grumman's Chinese Theater on, on Hollywood Boulevard. So it used to be the old ticket office right on the sidewalk and then back in you would see all the footprints and things like that that everybody were looked at and then you go into the theater. So they wanted somebody to carve a dragon that went all the way from the, from the sidewalk back in over the top of the other thing. So that's what I did. And they put a long tongue with air behind it that would flip out over Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard. That gets okay. some attention. That gets some attention. Yeah. Well, you've had uh, an extraordinary career then to be able to shift like that and be successful. But for me and a lot of people my age, yeah. you'll always be Morgan Earp. <laughs> Thank you. 94. Okay. Right. That was terrific. Watch your step coming down. Thank you.
My name is Rob Word, and we love bringing these programs to you. We've got a lot more scheduled coming up. We post a new one every single week, and we want you to subscribe, like, and share. Thanks for watching.